to talk. Uh, I'm Alex Sierra, a CTO at Needle and a principal at MLSAC project. This is Matt from Rapid7. Say hi, Matt. Hi, Matt. <laughs> okay. So, uh, we are here today to talk a little bit about behavioral economics and how it applies to information security. Let me see if I can figure out how to move to the next slide here. Ah, uh, yeah, that's going to be beautiful. So, uh, we would be starting on a very serious note where we had videos with direct evidence that people are not rational. So, someone skiing down an escalator or pur purposefully hitting their forehead on, on a fa ceiling fan for some reason. So, if you don't, still don't think that people are not rational, uh, you should go to the Darwin Awards Twitter account and find out. Uh, and why does this matter? Why should we care? Uh, because uh, as much as we like technology and as much as we like to be coding all day and picking the hardware apart and assembling things, truth is information security is about people at the end because it's about information. Information uh, will only have value in the context of people. Uh, if you define processes, it's people that are going to be executing and defining them. If you have technology, people are going to be choosing to buy it or not, implementing it, operating it, monitoring it, and no matter how cool the technology is, if the people don't do their jobs properly, you're going to be in trouble. And most importantly, your adversaries are people. So people really are, are key here. Slide. I love these slides, it's great. Uh, yeah, so, I mean, along with that. Wait, what? Come on. Move me. What if I put this so over a, here? A rabbi, uh, a nun, no, no, sorry, sorry. <laughs> uh, hey. Yeah, really. Um, so the point really is that the blame game doesn't work, right? Um, I, we all love the joke about you can't patch human stupidity. Um, I, first time I saw it, know that I laughed quite a bit, but it's not exactly true. Um, there are different ways that you can look at how you behave, how others behave, and, and cause them to think twice, cause them to have that kind of, uh, am I doing the right thing here? It's not just teaching them just saying it to them, but there are other ways to approach it. it. There is kind of a patch. It's not, it's just not that straightforward. And and all of that is based on the research that behavioral scientists are doing. Uh, when we call it reversing the wetware, that's exactly what they're doing. They're not thinking about how people are supposed to behave. They're actually measuring how they do actually behave. Personally, if you lose food, you could die as a hunter-gatherer. Uh, so we are not rational about losing things. And uh, we were historically living in small communities where it was very easy to keep track of everyone's reputation, uh, which we can all agree could not be further from what the internet looks like these days. <clears throat> and so the, the model that the behavioral sciences came up with is, <clears throat> it's like we have two different systems interacting in our brains. They call them very creatively system one and system two. Uh, so system one is doing all the background processing, think of like the the, the ROM or the operating system at the lower levels. That's making the brunt of the work. It's taking, making most of the decisions. And it's the system that's mostly involved with what we call involuntary or unconscious decision making. Um, and so it's, it impacts system two very, uh, uh, in a very important way. But system two is the rational part of our thinking. It's when we expend effort into, into being analytical, into making a deliberate decision. Uh, this is uh, where system two do we have? Okay. It's good. It's good. System 2 uh, working. And so kind of the uh, Spock and the Kirk analogy there. Oops. Oh, my God. The hidden slides are here. <laughs> oh, crap. I'm going to be going through them pretty quickly. This is going to be fun. This is not an actual slide. Yes. <laughs> Present at B-sides, they said. It's going to be fun, they said. <laughs> Okay, this is you. All right. Uh, I think this was a hidden one. Here we go, and here we are. All right, so the first area to talk about, you know, really in the section of uh, know thyself, um, is, is this effect of people often thinking and being overconfident, right? Thinking, I'm too good to fall for that trick, or generally, I'm really good at pretty much everything I do. Um, and this is a phenomenon that definitely exists in, in 
Lake Wobegon was this, this kind of example of a fictional place where everybody was good at everything, everybody was happy, the flowers always grew well. Um, and, and this is kind of something that people get caught up in, and there are a lot of different ways that can happen, but um, reality is you gotta, you got to kind of second-guess yourself, right? It, it sh am I really that... That good in this area? Does that make sense? Have I, is this completely new to me? Cause a lot of research has shown that people are not, there's no such thing as just naturally gifted at things. Uh, it's just a lot of favoritism and biases along the way lead to that. Um, and so getting through some more hidden slides, lovely. Um, so the first example really is, is experts who are actually amateurs. So they're an expert at something, um, but they think they're an expert in areas where they're not. Um, and one of my favorite examples was was interviewing uh, somebody that was an inf a security professional at, at a law firm, um, and he could not get anybody in the law firm to listen to him about social engineering. They would they would take the awareness training, basically click through everything and be done with it because their whole job every day was to trick other people and find loopholes. And there's no way somebody was going to possibly, possibly. Uh, outsmart them and trick them into clicking on a link because, you know, that's their job. Um, and then you may have seen another one of these happen just last week. Uh, CEO email was spoofed and sent to somebody and led to 80,000 employees' information being sent uh, outside the organization. Uh, we hear this a lot, but, um, you know, the, the problem would be reading this and thinking that would never help in our finance team. They'd never fall for that kind of trick. When in reality, you should second guess and, and, and kind of think through why did that happen to them? Why would they fall for it? How could I avoid the same thing? Um, and then here's some awesome videos, as you can see, um, of other people who think they're experts. Um, one man doing a lovely head plant trying to do a backflip, and then somebody else doing pretty similar. So I'm glad I described those slides, those uh, videos you couldn't see. Um, so another area is which is actually the opposite. And, and I, I definitely recommend if you have a chance to read uh, Scott um, S. Roberts' uh, imposter syndrome blog. Um, but this is a case of, you know, people that are experts um, seeing somebody else and listening and being in awe of them and thinking, wow, I, I really, so I'm, I'm in danger of being discovered at any minute, right? Like, I, I'm not actually as good as people think that, that I am, and I'm living the life of an imposter. Um, and this is a very common phenomenon. It might be, personally, it, you know, it's happened when I was hungover, I remember, and uh, could happen for any reason. You see some somebody speak, and you're just shocked. And uh, that's, you know, really what the diagram's showing is you see all these people with all this knowledge you don't understand and you overvalue that. Um, and so these are really the two ends of a very similar phenomenon and, and thought this chart was a good representation of it. But what it comes down to is if you don't think you can be outwitted, um, if you don't think you have more to learn and, and more to um, adjust and, and pay attention to, then you're not, you're not trying to get better. Um, you really should have that feeling on occasion. That's the way it is if, if you actually care about doing something effectively. And on the other side, if you feel like you're a complete imposter and everybody thinks, you know, you're doing a great job, they probably have a few points and you're probably just a little too far down that spectrum of thinking you're not very good. Um, and so, yeah. <laughs> So, uh, and, and professional certification. So let's try to make this a little bit more concrete for all of us. Uh, so Fernando Montenegro, uh, his, uh, wrote a couple of blog posts. We have the links on the recommended reading slide uh, about how certification, if you view them through regular standard economic point of view, it can be an interesting signal because there's an asymmetry of information and in the, the human resources market. A company doesn't know how good you are until they've hired you and let you work for a while. So it can be a signal. You're, you're showing them explicitly that you have a certain amount of knowledge. They can use that as a filter then to select better candidates, as imperfect as those are in the absence of real actual measurements of how good people are. It's the, the best most companies can do. But there's also uh, an aspect of behavioral economics here. So the first thing is uh, getting a certificate doesn't increase your knowledge. If you already studied for the test, actually paying the fee and taking the test does not make you any better at that skill. But the problem is, as soon as system one sees that you've added an acronym to your business card or to your email signatures and you reinforce that constantly, it causes system one to uh, over 
estimate how good you are at that skill. So you're in essence fooling yourself. Unless you stop and think, you will overestimate your cap capacity in that area. So you need to be really aware of that, especially in, in light of what Matt just said. And the other thing is, if you've gone through the trouble of studying and paying and taking the test, and it took some effort, uh, and it, you will then have a very low chance of thinking that that vendor's technology sucks, or that another certified person sucks, because that would be cognitive dissonance. Because I'm a good person, uh, uh, I know what I'm doing, and I took that certification. So how can that product suck? Or how can that other person that did the same thing also suck? And in order to resolve that cognitive dissonance, your brain will most likely say, this is all awesome. I'm going to ignore that evidence that I just got that the product sucks. So you are creating a bias in yourselves when you take certifications. Take that into account into your, uh, into your decision making. And the other thing is, the more tired you are, the less rational you are. Uh, there's something called ego depletion. <clears throat> when you use system one, it's automatic, it's effortless, it's running all the time. But you're using system two, when you're trying to make deliberate, conscious, analytical decisions, you get tired over time. System one, system two starts working less and less as you go around the day. There's a study that showed that judges that were uh, sitting all day just making decisions on paroles, they would be like a very unlikely, it's like close to 0% granting of paroles towards the end of the day because they were so tired, they were just falling back to their default position, which is, I can't think enough about this, I'm going to deny it because I don't know if I'll be letting a criminal out on the streets. And that has implications for us as well. So the first thing, if you're a social engineer, call people at the end of their shifts they'll not be thinking as well. You'll probably be more likely to fool them. And thing number two is maintenance windows. I mean, we depend on IT people making changes to system and not introducing vulnerabilities and making mistakes that could put your company in jeopardy. So please don't let IT people work all day and then stay longer to do a maintenance, a, a, a pick up a maintenance windows out of business hours because they won't be thinking straight and they will uh, make more mistakes. So another bias to consider um, is, you know, something that uh, Dan O'Reilly, who I think we've already mentioned, if not, um, we'll mention him a few times, but, um, sorry, Ariely, yeah. Ariely, uh, actually created the uh, Institute for Hindsight. Advanced hindsight um, all around this color thing because you will be judged unfairly. People will read a headline or see very little evidence and decide that, you know, you made a mistake. The team was at fault. Uh, my favorite example was for the Neiman Marcus breach uh, in February 2014. They, uh, they, they came out and said, how could these people have missed this? There were 60,000 alerts. And then if you read down in the fine print, you read further through the article, that was 1% of the number of alerts they received every day. So it's more like, well, of course they missed it. Um, this is an unreasonable standpoint, but it didn't matter. They're already guilty as the team was at fault in everybody's minds. And, uh, and the same sort of thing with, with Target that they disabled a feature that the vast majority of customers disable, but you know, they're still at fault. They're still to blame of negligence. And this sort of, you know, this hindsight is a reality. Um, so it, it is something to, to keep in mind. And obviously you can't always, you can't always help it. But, uh, the more you do to, to kind of have that second thought and, and, and second guess yourself, uh, before people have the chance on their own. Um, and uh, along the same lines, um, your heart, your gut, whatever you want to call it, is not scientific. Um, I'm not sure if any anybody in, in the room has read up on the airborne lawsuits. I think they had to pay back a billion dollars or something like that for because there was no scientific evidence that it worked. But I, I remember the first time I ever heard it on the radio, basically I think it was Howard Stern telling everybody, hey, every time I get sick, I take this and the cold doesn't come. So, yeah, that must have been because of airborne, right? Uh, that seems scientific enough. Um, and it's the same sort of thing. Like, do you have a specific event that's your source of truth? Do you just always get the, this bad feeling when something occurs? For the most part, that, I mean, you, you really need to dig for more explanation. It's, it's not as simple as I had this gut feeling that it, uh, time and time again that it's failed us uh, in, in experimentation. And hold on. <laughs> there we go. Love slides. Um, 
Uh, it's very, very relatedly, uh, people that have this, A, I, my team always wins um, when I sit on this spot on the couch or I, when I wear a specific underwear or something like that. You know, if, if you kept doing the same thing and it seemed to be working, um, that doesn't mean that that was what actually worked. It doesn't mean you shouldn't try other things. You shouldn't ask, like, is it logical that that was, that was what, what really occurred? Um, it's, again, this is the whole system one is just telling you, wait, I, based on the information I have, um, that I'm going to make up an explanation. Um, and sometimes you just don't have enough. You need to find more information. You have to, you have to dig a little deeper to understand why that really happened. Um, and this is skipped. Lovely. Um, and all this, I mean, to, to really summarize this section uh, all about know thyself, it, it's just question everything. Um, mostly yourself but also like why something isn't working with other people. Like why aren't they learning how to be more secure? Do they have, you know, is it ancillary to their day job and they have to get their work done? These, you know, the people in the org need to know, but it, some way to, to kind of trick them. Um, I, I'm a big fan of, you know, fishing your employees. I've, I got nailed last year by my <laughs> head of security um, in Project uh, Sea Monkeys, I think he called it. Um, but yeah, I, I clicked the link. Um, and even like table talk, top exercises. I don't know if your team thinks that they're they're cheesy or whatever, but you should probably even go further. You should try and, and uh, just inject random data in and see what, how the team reacts and test yourselves. Um, these sort of you, you need to trigger the system to the the actual critical thinking, or or you're going to make mistakes. We all are. In this next section, I'm going to be talking a little bit about Dan Ariely's research on cheating and morality. And that interests me because when you, uh, I've worked in consulting in a past life before, I'm almost fully recovered before you ask. And uh, by look, walking into so many different companies, one of the things I notice very often is that uh, there were like systemic problems where uh, a lot of people were making small mistakes, but when added up, they added huge amount of vulnerability and exposure to, to those companies. Like if you think uh, about IT people that know they shouldn't do something, but they do it anyway because they have to get that system up uh, very quickly and it's 2 a.m. already and they, you know, they want to get back home and sleep and get back to their wives or something. Uh, and so I think that research is really helpful. And the first thing you, you would imagine when you ask, why do people cheat? And this is the model that traditional economists used is people make rational decisions. So the likely of someone cheating or the amount they cheated on uh, would be proportionate to how much would they gain. So the more they gain, the more they would cheat. Uh, the chance of being caught, so the, uh, the, the, the bigger the chance of being caught, the less likely they would be to cheat. And the penalty as well. So if you increase the penalty, people would cheat less. None of which are true. If you test that in, 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 in with real people, uh, that's not simply just not what happens. And I invite you to read, uh, Ariely has an entire book on that subject, and it's really non-intuitive, counterintuitive, and, and surprising. So what he finds, the, the, the best working theory right now about how people cheat and how much they cheat is the fudge factor model, which is people will cheat uh, when they have an incentive to cheat, there's something to be gained, they will cheat as much as they can, as long as they can still rationalize it and still believe they are good people or they're not guilty at the very least. There was something accidental. And that shows up in a, in a variety of ways. So the most likely cheating you see is a lot of people cheating by a little bit and not just one guy getting in and robbing the entire bank. That's really, really rare. And so one of the things that he measured is the psychological distance you have to cheating. Uh, the, the further removed you feel from the cheating act itself, uh, the more likely you are to cheat and the more you're going to cheat. So for it's no coincidence that uh, when you look at online games, you don't buy the items inside the game in dollar amounts. You have to buy credits first and then you use those credits to buy the items. And that happens is because the further removed you are from money, the less rational your decision becomes. And that's that holds true for cheating as well. Uh, an experiment he did with golfing, it was something like people were twice as likely to cheat if they could you know, nudge the ball with their club instead of picking it up and dropping. It's the same cheating. Rationally, it's the same number of inches. But people would be less likely because picking up the ball is really, really deliberate, right? And if you think about 
people hacking online, they don't feel like they're real, stealing real things. It's, it's entries on a database. It's numbers on the person's PayPal account. Those same people would not, you know, pick your wallet. So it's easier to rationalize uh, uh, cheating uh, on that scenario. And the lesson here is you need to make the cheating more concrete. You need to make people realize through training, through UI design, they need to understand the concrete examples of the consequences of cheating. So if you are one guy inside a large criminal organization, you just write the malware. Someone talked about this in an earlier talk. If you just write the malware, but you never actually infect anyone or get any money, uh, you don't feel like you're a criminal. It's very easy to rationalize this. You must focus on giving people the big picture. You must tell call center uh, uh, attendants that, you know, if, if personal information from this company's customer is sold, you need to tell them a real teary-eyed story about, a, you know, a grandmother that lost everything because of identity theft. They must understand that there are real life consequences to doing that because then their irrationality will work in your favor. Something else is uh, conflicts of interest. Uh, you might have conflicts of, of interest that you don't understand. And uh, conflicts of interest work by affecting both system one and system two. And we can understand system two. We think, okay, that vendor took me out for dinner, but I'm not going to buy him more just because of that. I'm a smart person. I can make an, uh, an independent decision regardless of, of what he did. And that is not true. So Ariely did an fMRI experiment where he had people having to choose to, to say how much they liked paintings except the same paintings were sometimes presented as being sold by a gallery that had paid for their lunch previously, and sometimes the same painting would be presented as being from another gallery that didn't give them anything. And as you expect, people said they liked the paintings from the, the gallery that paid their lunch more, but it was not a conscious decision. He was measuring them under fMRI. Their pleasure centers activated more. They genuinely enjoyed the paintings more when the same painting came from an art gallery that had bought them lunch. So think about that. When you guys are out there making decisions, that is impacting you. And the processes you design in organizations need to take this into account. The what the hell effect is tied to ego depletion. So once you start uh, doing bad decisions, you say, what the hell, I've already eaten one donut, my diet is gone anyway, I might as well eat the whole box, right? And that applies to cheating as well. Once people stopped making rational decisions, they will go down on that uh, slippery slope. And there's another effect that happens over time, which is the normalization of deviance, which is, as a group, sometimes organizations will start not playing by the rules just a little bit, and then that becomes the new normal. And then they stop following another rule. So they just not fudged it by a little bit, and on and on it goes until you get things like there was a plane accident where uh, a group of pilots was doing that and, and dropping things from their checkups, their checklists, uh, one at a time over a period of years, and accidents are rare, but then they dropped enough things that it, they caused an accident, and, and that was a, a big problem. And how can you combat that? I'm sure each one of you sometimes got into a new job and looked at what's going on and said, whoa, this is effed up. This is really, really bad. People don't even realize how much they deviated from what they should be doing. And what the experience tells us here is that resetting events work. So many religions have something like confession or, or you know, have rituals that allow you, give you a psychological way of resetting your score. And in South Africa, they had the Truth and Reconciliation Commissions that allowed people to confess things, horrible things they did in exchange for leniency, but they also psychologically allowed them to say, okay, that's past me now. I accepted it, I'm absolved, I can move on and not be that person anymore. So maybe there's a way that we can do that with organizational cultures in regard to security as well. Payback and altruism. People don't cheat just to benefit themselves. In fact, they cheat more if it's going to benefit other people's because that's even easier to rationalize. Robin Hood probably would steal more than if he ju was just stealing for himself because he feels justified in what he's doing. And I think that might explain a lot of what we see on hacktivism, uh, the motivations behind this. If you feel what you're doing is, is good, if you're working for a nation state and you feel you're a patriot and you think that's the right thing to do, you will bend the rules more.
Also, to get back at people. Uh, they, they had an experiment where you would be on a coffee shop and an experimenter would give you more money than you should. And if that guy had been polite to you, 45% of people gave the money back, the extra change back. If he had been rude, like taking a call, wait a second, taking a call while he was talking to people and then go, going back, something very simple, only 14% did. And the lesson here is, that's going to be a hard one for this audience, be nice to people. Okay, I'm saying that again, be nice. You can do it, I believe in you. Uh, we like to make people examples of, but we usually focus on the bad examples, on the punishments. We need to get the the IT group within your organization that has the best security and you need to be talking really good things about them and letting everyone know, else know these guys are awesome. You should be all doing the same things they are. We like to badmouth people because it makes us look smart. Look how stupid he is. He shouldn't be doing that. We should be doing the exact opposite because the social examples affect how people make moral decisions a lot and that has definite consequences for fraud and for information security. And our brains have caches, as we found out. Since, and it's not surprising for a bunch of engineers, you had real-time constraints, you have to make real-time decisions. Caching is a good idea, so System 1 thought so as well. And what Ariely found out is, you, if you prime the cache of your brain with morality, morality in any way, shape, or form, even non-existing forms of morality. If you get an atheist to swear on a Bible, if you get a, pe a person at a university that doesn't have an honor code and say, remember you have to stick to the honor code. The honor code doesn't exist, but by the simple fact that you've made people think about morality before they make a decision, they will make more moral decisions. So he, he got a simple form from an insur insurance company where people had to self-report how many miles they'd driven with their car every year. And just by moving the signature where they say, you know, this information is correct and I stand by this, to the top of the form, so people would do that prior to entering the data, he was able to diminish the number of reported miles by 15%. So this is direct implications for awareness training, for user interface design, for process design that you need to take into account. It's a really, really easy small change to make. Makes a, a, a lot of difference. Oops, uh, oh, that's fun. Yay, okay, here it is. Uh, and this is something you don't hear every day. Be grateful for unfriendly auditors. What happened was he, under he tried to uh, study the effect of monitoring. Bottom line is, if you are not being monitored, you will cheat. If you are being monitored by someone you have social close, uh, close social ties with, you will cheat more, not less, but if you are being monitored by someone who doesn't talk to you at all, or you have no social ties with, then cheating goes really close to zero. So yes, auditors should be, you know, antisocial people. That actually makes sense. It's scientific. You heard it here first. So <clears throat> let's talk about what we can do. We need to be very careful about designing rules and incentives because now that we know a little of those things, if we let people make decisions by themselves, unmonitored, they have incentives pushing them to do the wrong thing and they can make, they can, they are free to interpret the decisions they make by any way they can, you will have problems. And I think a good example is, the, the, the good people at Facebook did a wonderful thing that they had a bug bounty program. You heard a little bit about this on this stage earlier, uh, which is awesome. I, I love them for it. But they had a small problem recently. There was this brouhaha with this researcher that pivoted. He found a vulnerability. Instead of just reporting it, he pivoted right on, on it. And uh, it was probably really easy for the researcher to rationalize this. He's a pen tester. That's what he does every day. He gets pats on the back when he's does that successfully with his customers, right? There was no explicit rule anywhere on the bounty rules saying you cannot pivot, you must stop at the first vulnerability. So he could very easily rationalize for himself, what I'm doing is not wrong. And he was making all of those decisions by himself and not checking with anyone else 
because the only point of contact is when you, when you actually disclose the vulnerability. So not, even if you know pen testing, you know vulnerability uh, research very well, it doesn't mean that you can very easily build a system of rules or incentives to make that work economically. So maybe you should involve someone else when designing those rules. And I'm pretty sure people at Facebook are really, really smart and will get that, that solved pretty quickly. So yeah, at least we can trust vendors, right? Uh, I mean, it, we're trying not to, you know, leave any person involved in an entire process out. Uh, it, it affects everybody. Um, you really can't just trust headlines. Um, as I explained a little before, but it, you know, you read the actual headline at the bottom and you'd never believe what was said at the top. And again, it's a statistic as if it's real. Guarantee it was totally made up. Um, a lot of these things are what we hear every day. And so you have to, you really have to think about what kind of, um, what kind of reality is behind these statistics? Is this something that means I, I'm, I'm going to be compromised as well? Is it, is it even relevant? Does it, does it mean anything? Um, because a lot of people misuse statistics. They misunderstand statistics, but it, it really leads to why FUD marketing still exists, right? Um, uh, it's, it comes to this whole, uh, something that's called the, the availability cascade where I'll tell you, my mother-in-law thinks we're in the most dangerous time in history. Um, that no, no scientific evidence supports that, but you hear more um, going back to what Alex said about evolving to be in small tribes, to small groups. If you heard about somebody dying from a crocodile, you probably had a chance that could happen to you because you only knew 25 people, and that means crocodiles are near your village. But today, if you hear about people dying in shark attacks and plane crashes, our our brain hasn't evolved more. We still think wow, that's likely to happen to me because I hear about it all the time in the news when in reality, you know, it's just not going to happen. Um, you, you may, if you hear about somebody that, and you know them through five different links in some chain, uh, that doesn't make it likely to happen to you. Uh, and, but the problem is a lot of buying decisions, a lot of these budgets that are, that are, that are doled out are, are according to what's the most common in the, in the news, right? Like what people heard as a big breach and what was the cause of it. Um, I've, I've spoken to people saying, you know, if you don't have a plan to secure your third party vendors, you're screwed just because of, you know, the, the big, very newsworthy examples. And without, without question, yes, you should think about that avenue, but that, you know, that doesn't mean you're all set, right? Just because you've, you've really created a really secure way for, for your HVAC company to, to log in. Um, and so, um, Something that came up during our realist research is that uh, creativity is a really good predictor for how much you are able to cheat. Because if you are better equipped to rationalize, invent a story in your own head that justifies what you're doing as moral, you are really going to be more likely to cheat, and you're going to cheat by a larger amount. If that has any correlation or not with how information security products are marketed, I'll leave that up to you. Yeah. Um, and another very similar thing is, is, trust, is, is trusting what you read as opposed to digging deeper, hearing, hey, this, this startup's catching fire. They're, They've got all the right plan. They've got this great product they're going to come out with in two years because they've got, they've got some guys from the NSA. Um, I, I, re, I equate that to, um, what's called, uh, this green lumber fallacy where, uh, this expert, he came out, he did thorough, he did this really deep, um, investigation into how commodities trading works and how that shifts from year to year. And he went in and he lost all of his money trying to buy and sell green lumber. And when they, went back and he interviewed the, the man made, making millions and doing this every day, most successful uh, green lumber trader out there pretty much, he actually thought the green lumber, you know, freshly cut, not wait to dry, that's all green means, he thought it was just lumber that people paint green. It really didn't matter that he had no idea what he was trading. His expertise was in trading. So, you know, why does it make sense? Uh, I, the, I mean, I, I remember myself trying to work with 
salespeople and hearing the conversation going toward, hey, you know, we got this great detection te technology, you know, because HD Moore is involved. And it's like, what's that have to do with detection, you know? And, and so it's, it's always like, why would that be relevant? Is it relevant is, is basically the question uh, you, you need to ask when you, when you read something that sounds just too good. And the other thing is to always consider what's unsaid, right? Um, do you want a product that stops 90% of malware? Yeah, that sounds pretty great, but that doesn't mean you're fully secure, right? It's the same, it's the same thing as if you look at what is actually stated, you have to do the quick math, right? It's, it's almost like a foreign currency calculation. Like, oh, this isn't worth it. Wait, let me, let me think through this a little bit more. If you're saying that it price starts at $99, that's actually 100, or suddenly it sounds like a lot more money. And if 90% of malware gets through, Sorry, 90% of malware is blocked. That still means 10% gets through. I have to have all these other countermeasures in place. I need to do something else. It's not enough. It just sounds great to say it in this framing. How you frame it is, is very important. And, and people in marketing, you know, this is taught. This is, this is understood. You wouldn't want to put up on, on your website or, or in your materials something that doesn't sound great. Um, you, you want to make it sound as, as good as you can. Um, and again, going back to who's making the buying decisions, who's, who's creating the budget, you need to have some kind of communication with your, with your leadership. You need to either that or find somebody new, but really have that opportunity to, uh, oh, okay. I guess we're pretty much over since we started late, but, uh, um, but really the ability to, uh, to admit when investment really didn't work out. It, it, it just wasn't, it wasn't, uh, justified in the end and you need to find an alternate route. The sooner you can do that, the better, because otherwise you're throwing good money after bad. Um, and so, uh, I, I guess we can skip through a couple of these real quick, but the, the next high level point is, is really don't get, have this, uh, confirmation bias. Check, second guess yourself if you think, you know, every time I check out a product, it's bad. Try to look for a better solution. Yes, you're going to be able to build some really great things. Um, but there are times, like, if, if you just leave everything to your team, to just a couple of individuals, you will find patterns where they're not. You will find problems where they're not. It's just you have to, A, justify to yourself that you're having an impact. And, and you know, the, it, it, it comes down to the high-level question about looking to take conclusions away from humans and have all the solutions be, be human mind that it's still the best for it. But the more you can have machines and, and automation do the rest, the better and, and more impactful. Um, because there, there are times and you'll just try and solve a problem when it doesn't exist. You know, finding the problem is, is something the machines and, and automation can help with. Solving the problem is what the human, human brain is really best at. So since we went over, uh, really just want to, uh, Recommend some reading based on where a lot of, you know, these different concepts come from. There have been a couple of presentations before, um, uh, on, on this kind of topic around behavioral economics and infosec. Uh, I suggest you check those out. Um, and otherwise, um, I promise we weren't the cause of this, the video problem, but, uh, yeah. Yeah. That's why we have to stop now. <laughs> Dear besides people, do we have time for questions? Uh, apparently no. If anyone has questions,